Welcome everyone, I'm Dick Deming, Medical Director of Mercy One Cancer Center and founder of Above and Beyond Cancer. Uh, welcome to our Cancer Education Series, which is brought to you with funding from the Iowa Cancer Consortium. And you're in for a treat, a dog treat, right? <laughs> hey, Gus. Gus, are you awake? <laughs> Gus, hi. So we have Gus with us and also his uh, masters, owners, parents, friends, um, <laughs> Kennedy and Jack. Fritz Junker, and they are owners and operators of Dog Training Elite. And we're going to spend this evening having a conversation about the, the benefits of pets, in particular dogs. We'll talk a bit about therapy dogs and service dogs and emotional support dogs. But first, let's welcome our guests. So welcome, Kennedy and Jack. Thank okay. you. Is that close enough? Yeah. Yes. So... <laughs> Okay, so what was the first dog you ever owned, Kennedy? Or that you ever, you know, I assume, did you have dogs growing up? Uh, always, never. Always. I don't think I was ever without what's a dog. What's the first dog you remember from your childhood? The very first dog I remember is Abraham, who was a German shepherd. Um, great dog, used to try to get on the bus with me every morning. And he would always be, at, we had a really long lane. We lived in the country and he would always be sitting at the end of the lane. When I got off the bus at night, he always knew what time. I would come home on the bus. So he was a great dog. That's, I think I probably had dogs before that, but I don't remember. And Jack, what was the first dog in your life? Maybe Oscar? You were pretty little when we had Oscar. Yeah. And so yeah. what was Oscar? Oscar was a Cocker Spaniel. I, I guess I probably remember him more from pictures than anything else. <laughs> okay. um, but, uh, but yeah, we've had, I've had dogs my whole life as well. Gus here is my first dog all on my my own oh, basically on your own. yes oh, right so he has so a special my place my first one i remember was that they were uh, buster and brownie and they were american water spaniels oh so yeah. dad was a big hunter but the one i remember the most was uh, and that was buster and brownie would have been uh, maybe 6 or 7 but then we had through most of my like uh, maybe 5th grade through part of college was snoopy who was uh, like half dachshund and half black lab. No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What does that look like? And, and it was not like a designer <laughs> dog. It was a, it happened in the backyard sort of <laughs> design, gotcha. I think. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, when did um, dog training become part, become your profession? Uh, pretty recently. I mean, we always, growing up, our family, um, always did like foster care for the ARL and things like that. So we would informally train dogs. We would get them through like the potty training, crate training, um, sit, you know, just those basic commands, those um, concepts. And then get, then we would, when they were ready to be adopted, they would, you know, go back to the shelter and, and go to their new home. So we kind of always as a family did it informally, but uh, Jack and I started this business a year ago. So okay, we uh, are officially dog trainers as of a year ago, professional, like with actual training, not just you're, it. you're trained, you right. have papers, we have, right? We do. We have a lot of papers. Okay. Yes. Well, excellent. Well, um, as you know, in the, in the healthcare uh, setting, we uh, often get graced by having a therapy dog come visit. And um, I am there probably are other types of therapy pets, but most common is dogs. And uh, having grown up with dogs and just, you know, you just see the, the love and joy that comes on a patient's face mm -hmm. and relaxation. And um, so tell us a little bit about um, uh, therapy dogs and sort of the theory behind why therapy dogs bring... Oh, wellness or just you, your own experience with therapy dogs? Um, well, I, they have uh, documented incidents with um, the, like the, the way that therapy or not, they weren't therapy dogs, but the way that dogs interact in a, in a positive way and, and elevate mood and reduce stress way back to like the forties, the Red Cross used them to, to, uh, for soldiers with PTSD. Um, they also had these, I think they were called relax and recuperation farms for soldiers coming back from the war in the forties, where they would go and take care of animals. And that seemed to help them recover from, um, you know, emotional and physical things that had happened to them in the war. So it started way back, um, 
probably well before that, but that's the first that I could really find in doing the research when I started this business with therapy dogs. Um, and as far as like the, the benefits, uh, I always have to bring a list because there's so many benefits that I always forget a few, but um, elevating mood, stress and anxiety reduction. They're starting to use dogs with kiddos getting MRIs just because it's such a difficult thing for anybody that's ever had an MRI or been with a kiddo who's getting an MRI how stressful that is for them. But the hospitals that are using dogs um, in the room are seeing just a huge dramatic increase in successfully being able to complete those MRIs because the dog helps the kids, kiddos stress level go down. Um, comfort, they're using dogs um, for comfort in like court and in forensic interviews with kiddos who have been sexually abused and just aren't able to really talk about it, but you put a dog in the room and they can tell the dog their story. And so that's reducing their anxiety and and helping them um, perform those interviews. Um, loneliness, they're using dogs in nursing homes. I mean, we all know that's been probably, when you think about therapy dogs, that might be the most common mm -hmm. one that's used is, is using them with um, people in nursing homes, but they've done all sorts of studies and research on um, nursing home patients who self-report like quality of life before and after starting pet therapy and how significantly that has increased their quality of life and their loneliness or their reduction of loneliness by having pet therapy or even taking care of, even taking care of birds. They did a, a, a research study on um, a group of patients that had, they, I think it was a canary or something, and mm -hmm. that, even that showed mm -hmm. a significant decrease in loneliness and quality of life um, uh, scale when they do it assessed before and after. Um, memory, dogs can help with memory with Alzheimer's patients and people with traumatic brain injuries. They've shown that they can help with that by interacting with the dog. They're able to remember more things. Um, distraction, uh, they're a happy, happy distraction. They're using them with people who are like waiting for treatment and during the process of receiving treatment, the dogs are able to um, just give them something else to think about so that yeah. they, they report less pain and less stress and anxiety going into their treatment. I think the one thing, I mean, when you have a dog with you in the room, it's yeah. just, it's, it's, you're with the dog, you're present mm -hmm. in, in this moment. And so what it allows you to do is shut off the regrets of yesterday exactly. and the worries of tomorrow and just be present. Hey, Gus, I want to be present with you. Well, and dogs live hey, in the Gus. moment, you know, they're so very in the moment. Gus. And I think they teach us how to be oh, in the moment. We got to show the audience. <laughs> yes, wake up, Gus. Oh it's my goodness. Are you awake? There we go. You are so beautiful. So Gus, <laughs> what do you like to do? Oh, uh, you're seeing it. Like you like mm -hmm. to lick. That's right. right he loves to be with yeah. people and he loves oh, to nap. Yeah. Licking, oh, sitting on feet, got it. leaning up talk. against somebody. If he could sit on your lap, he would be very, very I've happy. I've learned that Gus is not quite a therapy dog yet. He's <laughs> a, a pup that's going to get trained because he's got the right sentiment. Yeah, the right <laughs> essence there, don't you? Can you show me your paw? Paw. <laughs> I can do it. Oh, there he goes. Here we go. Here we it's go. It's hard paw. to get comfortable and raise your oh, there, we there we go. go. <laughs> Good job. So tell me about Gus. So Jack, tell me what yeah. where, um, where did you get Gus and what's Gus Gus's uh, heritage? Uh, so <laughs> Gus is just a mix of all the bully breeds out there. He's probably got Bull Mastiff, American Staffordshire Terrier, um, American Bulldog. So he's just kind of a conglomeration of all all those different thick breeds. Um, I got Gus basically off of Craigslist um, when he was pretty pretty young so i've had him most of his life um when i first got him i didn't really know where uh where he would lie if he would be a service dog if he would be a therapy dog or just a pet dog um and on that note like when i'm evaluating a client's dog for therapy i look for a lot of the qualities that gus has so his favorite thing in life is interacting with people i don't know if you guys have noticed but every time somebody comes in he'll wake up and he might not lift his head up but he'll <laughs> wag his tail a little bit because all he wants in life is to interact with people and that's really really important for therapy is part of the reason that a lot of people get a lot out of therapy is because the dog is looking for all this attention you can see like exactly what you're talking about with the presentness where his focus is whoever is you know basically making eye contact with him so those qualities are really important in a therapy dog um, and Gus has got all that he's 
we got a little bit of excess excitement. And with a lot of dogs, that's okay with him weighing about 85 pounds and it's all muscle. You gotta be a little bit, a little bit more careful. Um, and then also with therapy, you kind of tailor the dog to the environment. So for Gus, like a youth center would probably be the best thing for him because that fits into the environment there a little bit more than um, like a nursing home or something like that, where you may want a smaller dog. Um, but yeah, with therapy, you just kind of look yes, for. We would that, not so. want you knocking Granny. No. <laughs> so, um, uh, tell me about how do you all get trained to be a trainer for service dogs and uh, therapy dogs? Sure. Um, so that's part of the reason why we ended up buying uh, the franchise that we did is we had an understanding of how to teach basic obedience and stuff like that. But both of our passions lie with helping people. So we wanted to figure out a way that we could do that with dogs. And what Dog Training Elite did for us is teach us the more advanced portion of training. So whether that's therapy, service, or like scent work, all sorts of different stuff. So we went and um, basically learned how to do all that in Utah. Um, so they taught us service dog task work, therapy dog stuff, all sorts of fun things like that. Um, there's a lot that goes into therapy dogs and there's a lot that goes into service dogs. So it is a pretty complicated and extensive process. Most therapy dogs take around a year to a year and a half of training before they're um, fully ready and service dogs are comparable, maybe a little bit longer, uh, but so let's let's define those terms. So we've um, I mentioned three different terms: mm -hmm. uh, the therapy dog, service dog, and an emotional support dog. Mm -hmm. So how would you characterize and distinguish those three types of uh, pets? Um, so the the main difference between the three of those is I'll start with ESA because that's kind of the lowest level of all of them. So an ESA is just an animal that provides emotional support. So technically with ESA, you don't need any training. You don't need anything. Um, they don't have to have like an AKC, canine good citizen test or anything like that. They just need to be a dog that provides <laughs> emotional support. Um, so basically any dog can be an ESA. Don't require any any obedience or right anything. yeah there's yeah. no requirements because they don't have any public gotcha. access rights which right yeah and that whole uh, emotional support animal is kind of a little bit um confusing and mm -hmm. um in flux you know and not every entity recognizes it and uh right. you know there's all sorts of stories about well you know i've got my iguana and i need to fly with it because <laughs> it's my emotional support and and yeah. the, the, it was hard to come up with real objective rules, I think of the airlines in particular, where mm -hmm. where occasionally things <laughs> would get a bit out of hand, and and they they didn't know where they stood legally and medically. Like, mm -hmm. is this, uh, you know, uh, to somebody, are you going to get in trouble with um, disability laws mm -hmm. because you don't allow an emotional? Right support peacock on the right, airplane right. or something you know and, and i don't mean to make fun of <laughs> no it's emotional true. support but it was hard mm -hmm. to do to, to <laughs> distinguish that and um so i think that they've um tightened up a bit more and uh, understand that uh, dogs because of their um their long history of service animals and therapy animals they're probably a little bit more lenient with dogs than with all the other things yep exactly yep and dogs don't have to have even service animals don't have to have any identification and, and so it's it is hard I, I feel i think it's very challenging for stores and um you know the airlines and things for a while anyway because you can't really say you know is is the, what's your disability what is this dog for you can ask if it's a service animal and what tasks they perform but that's legally the only gotcha. the only two questions that you can ask so i think that they had to tighten some things because it was very hard for them to distinguish between just somebody who loves their dog and wants to take their dog everywhere or somebody who legally has a right to have that mm -hmm. dog in public with them everywhere they go because they're performing a task talk about service them. animals a service dog and in particular what what's the definition of a service dog and and how do you train a service dog and what are some of the tasks that they do for their their clients what? their owners their uh, oh gosh that yeah. yeah so there there's a lot to that question there um as far as 
like what a service dog is. It's a dog that provides a task for, for their handler. Um, so for example, a, a diabetic alert dog would alert when your blood pressure drops below like 91. Blood sugar, yeah. Or blood sugar, sorry. <laughs> below 91 or alert at a high level of like 250 or something like that. So what that dog can do is save somebody's life and let them know like, okay, your blood sugar is dropping right now. We need to do something to fix this. So they're providing some sort of task that aids that person in public or on the PTSD end of things. If it's someone who has severe PTSD, the dog can help them like ground them. So if they're having some sort of dissociative episode or something like that, the dog can provide a task of some sort like deep pressure therapy in order to bring them back to reality. So it's things like that, that a, that a service dog would provide for them. Um, as far as the training goes, it's a very extensive process. Um, it generally takes somewhere around two years or so to get a dog fully through that program. And just depending on what type of service dog it is kind of changes that and, process. And drastically. would a service dog for the blind be a subdivision of service dogs or is that That's, a whole different classification? I mean, I guess it, it, it is in the same theory. We don't do anything with um, guide dogs. with guide dogs. Guide dogs. Um, so that's so. what that's what we call. So if your dog, for someone who's uh, visually impaired, they yeah. call that a guide mm -hmm. dog, and that's a different level of certification. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, there's yeah. a lot that goes into that. Um, yeah, the service dogs that we do are mobility, psychiatric, PTSD, um, personalized autism canines, um, diabetic alert dogs, and other medical alert dogs too, not just diabetic alert. Um, other medical alert, like leave anything out. And are there yeah. different breeds of dogs that are better for different services? Yep, Absolutely. definitely. So yeah. the reason that you see, like with, with most service dogs, you generally see golden retrievers, labs, and German shepherds are, they tend to be the best fit for work. But if you look at like diabetic alert, for instance, you'll see different dogs there because it's more of a scent based thing versus mobility where you might see like Bernese mountain dogs or larger dogs. So it kind of depends on the tasks that you're looking for. Um, and that kind of determines the breed of dog basically. But the way that we do our models, we work with dogs that people already have. So we have like pit bulls like him in the program. We've got doodles. We've got all sorts of different breeds. I see. So your particular business, you'd be, you'd be more likely that the person uh, already has a dog and you're training yep. their dog mm -hmm. that they already own and love to be mm -hmm. able to provide a service or provide exactly. therapy. Gotcha. Yeah, um, especially, right, right, if we can. If so we, we can. do like an evaluation and all that, but. Because um, not every dog no. can pass. It's an elite, it's an elite category. Okay. So right. there are dogs that wash out or there are dogs that we just have to say, I'm sorry, this dog's just not, doesn't have the the personality or the drive mm -hmm. or um, the ability to do the training to make it through the program. So we do have to say no sometimes to a, a yeah, dog that somebody currently has, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. It's not fun, but. So I would imagine, but perhaps I'm wrong, that the, the category of therapy dog, talk a bit about therapy dog, that might be open to a larger breed and maybe mm -hmm. a, a, a IQ span that's greater than <laughs> what you need for a service dog? Uh, so therapy is, is different in a couple different ways. Um, the main difference between therapy and service specifically is that a therapy dog is trained to serve multiple people. So each different time they go into a hospital or something, they're going to be serving someone else. So the way that we train for that is quite a bit different because a service dog is taught to essentially ignore everyone in the world except for their person. Um, so when you look for dogs, like he would not make a great service dog because he would like to go interact with, with y'all rather than paying attention to me. It's very hard for him to stay here and not go and sit on everyone's feet. Um, so you do definitely look for different things. And then with therapy, our test is also quite a bit different than a service dog test. So the therapy test is actually quite a bit more difficult than the service dog test because with therapy, they have to be able to interact with a bunch of different people and also handle you know, crazy situations that may happen yeah. um, whenever you're taking a dog out into public. You can't predict and you can't test for or prepare for everything that they'll be um, seeing when they are out working. So um, it is quite a bit more intensive. So one thing that I have seen is uh, um, the therapy dogs, they wear a vest when they're mm -hmm. on duty. Yeah. And so they know they're on duty. Mm -hmm. And one of the, I was just amazed. So I have friends that work at Child Serve, and Child Serve has their own therapy dog that 
to 40 mm -hmm. hours a week, works mm -hmm. there at child service, but then it goes home mm -hmm. at night with the child's uh, life specialist and lives at home. Well, I met the dog with the vest on. Mm -hmm. And five minutes later, they took the vest off. And holy moly, the difference. I mean, it, it was just so well behaved yep. and polite <laughs> and, and meek and mild. And then they took the vest off and it's like, I'm Gus. <laughs> Can I lick you? <laughs> it's amazing that yes, how quickly Gus, they pick up on you. that, putting that vest mm -hmm. on or, or even sometimes certain situations like going out in public, they'll just, even without the vest on, they'll just automatically kind of go into that work mode, mm -hmm. but they quick, very quickly catch on to work mode versus being at home. And they can be, it's almost like two different dogs. It's, it's amazing how quickly they, they catch on to that. Right. And Gus is a really good example of kind of the medium point of therapy training where he's got all the basic obedience and he can sit here and be relatively polite on his place, Scott, um, without me having to kind of manage him. But we haven't done much of the kind of out in public or interacting with people portion of things yet. Um, so you can kind of see that, that middle point with him. Yeah, this is not a cushy down uh, comforter or a blanket <laughs> that he's laying on. So this, you can call this a a cot, a cot, and and he knows that uh, okay, I'm supposed to stay here yep, and, yep. and not get off and go yep. run around. Yeah, so this is just one of the basic obedience commands that we teach, and I call it the place command basically. So he knows he has to put all four paws on this elevated object, and it's his job to stay on there. So that's why you'll see every once in a while he'll get really excited and he'll kind of fall off it, and then immediately he gets back <laughs> on because he knows that's where he's supposed to be. Um, tell us some um, examples of. Uh, let's start with service, uh, service dogs that you guys have trained and a little bit about their owner and uh, the act of training and how it may have changed their lives. Hmm. So um, I guess as far as the changing life things go, especially with service dogs, um, what I see kind of going to the back to the point of therapy is for a lot of people, just the act of having a dog and having something structured to do training wise every day is about 70% of the battle. So the way that we do our training is we focus on before we even start task work, we focus on getting the dog capable of being out in public. Because for most people, just the act of having a dog out in public with them, especially if you're looking at like a PTSD client or a high anxiety client that's most of the battle right there um, and then we we start our task work after that um, but for most people just the act of having something to do with mm -hmm. another being of some sort is is mm -hmm. a big portion of what what helps them there so you're training the dog and and you're also training the human mm -hmm. yes yeah and <laughs> how much of the training is all of the training with both the human and the dog, or do you sometimes take the dog for a week to to get it instilled in some so, behaviors, or, or how does that work? Yeah, so the way that we do our training is essentially what I do is I teach people how to train a service dog, because in my opinion, having the client with, you know, teaching the client how to do it and me kind of stepping them through each um, each step of the way is the most sustainable way to do it because what that allows them to do is have the information to uphold that training well after I'm out of the picture. Um, so there's very few situations where I will interact with the dog on my own. I would much prefer to teach them and give them the tools to handle if, you know, if the dog is overexcited or if the dog's not alerting or doing their tasks, I want them to know so how to do So what do, do you that. do if like the dog's a good candidate, but the human is like just <laughs> unable to say no and unable uh, to uh sort of that's that's come up against that a few times yeah, yeah that's a tough um, situation those are tough conversations that we've had to have <laughs> yeah. um over look at your dog's gonna pass your dog's, but i'm yeah, sure but, you're gonna pass because it is a big commitment and it's a rigorous program and it they it, they all come to a point where they're pretty frustrated because the first 90 percent that there were they see a lot of progress in a pretty short period of time, but it's that last 10% that's difference between like a service and a therapy dog and just a really nice dog. And that 10% takes a year, you know, or, or nine months or whatever. And you don't see as much progress, but it's just repetition and um, practice daily. And so they've just get to the point where they're like, is my dog ever going to get there? I'm, I'm just, you know, I'm doing all this work and I'm not seeing a lot of progress. So that's something that those are tough conversations to have too, because we have to just keep saying, you got to do your part. You got to keep working at it. And some people 
that's hard. That's hard because it's a it's long and it's rigorous and it's monotonous and it's not easy. And it, it's a huge commitment. So not everybody is a good candidate. The dog might be a fabulous candidate, but sometimes people mm -hmm. you know just don't have um, the commitment to get through that program. So have you ever trained a service dog to be able to bag its own excrement? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, we, gosh, gosh, if we could do that, that we'd be, be millionaires for sure. Okay. <laughs> hmm. I haven't really. Mm -hmm. So Jack um, could probably figure out how to do that. Other, actually. other <laughs> examples of uh, clients and their dogs that um, you can describe and the way it had an impact on their lives. Um, so most of the of the service dogs we do are for PTSD. Mm -hmm. um, so I have a lot of clients that fall into a very similar category of they struggle a lot out in public. So that's kind of the biggest thing that I see with our with our service dog clients is the dog gives them the freedom and the confidence out in public to you know feel comfortable to go interact with other people. Um, so I don't necessarily want to talk about clients in specific, specific right? Um, sure, but that is kind of the the big mm -hmm. thing that I see with with PTSD clients. Well, and, anxi and yeah. anxiety, yeah, reducing anxiety, yeah. anxiety and depression, and it's just you know that social like you have something to do when you've got your dog out in public, mm -hmm. somebody to talk to. So it's a it's a way to start a conversation. Mm -hmm. It just takes some of the pressure right. off of those social, social situations and people who have anxiety and depression, a dog is a great way to get them out in the community, you know, losing weight, getting active, things like that, that the dog is because of the training, you know, they have to be, they have to be working with that dog daily and they have to be taking walks and teaching the dog how to heal. And all of those things are forcing people who normally might not leave their house to leave their house on a, on a daily basis and to get themselves in situations that they normally would have been pretty uncomfortable in. But because of the dog, they're able to go you know, through those barriers. And I think when people hear PTSD, they, they automatically think of servicemen returning mm -hmm. who had a difficult time. But, but as you're expanding, you know, that's, it could be someone with mm -hmm. very high anxiety level yep. who's yep. just yep. doesn't want to leave the house. Just yep. it's awkward and afraid yep. to be, or, um, feel so self-conscious mm -hmm. and bringing the animal along is I've got this buddy with me exactly. and if yep. I'm a little anxious about all of these folks I got my buddy here and if you have a dog people aren't looking they aren't looking at you they're looking at mm -hmm. the you know the dog is the one that's getting the attention which is a great way to reduce someone's anxiety um to have, yeah it's their dog that they're talking you know and I've seen a lot of anxious people who can talk for length at their about their dog and everything great that their dog's doing. They can't necessarily talk about themselves, but it's just a great way to, for them to still have some social interactions with people, but it's about their dog. So it makes it easier to do. Well, let's talk some more about the therapy dog, because um, I would imagine that uh, that that somebody who comes to you says, I want my dog to be a therapy dog. Um, they kind of have this altruistic, they, they mm -hmm. want to, to help others. Mm -hmm. Now they know they're going to feel good about it themselves and that'll, that'll be good, but they're probably not someone who's high anxiety and in need of a service right. dog. There's somebody who right. is highly functioning and loves their dog, but would love to be able to have their dog bring joy, joy. Yeah. and well-being to others. Yep. So that's a, probably a different type of client dog pair that yep. you train. Absolutely. No, that's a good point because yeah, they're coming for completely different reasons. They, pro Most of the people that we have in the therapy dog training program are very social. They just really want to give back. They want to get out. They love their dog. They love being around people and they want their dog to love that experience too. And it's a way for them to yeah engage in the community more. So um, we have a lot of great teams right now. They're about ready to graduate in every kind of breed. And that's the thing too. You know, we're looking not necessarily for dogs that can perform tasks that are have to have a certain nose or a certain size uh -huh. for mobility or whatever, but dogs who have that personality like he's talking about for Gus. Um, and so. So what would be some of the things you would do? I, I've got Gus is my dog. He's two years old. He loves me. He loves everybody. <laughs> I want him to be a therapy dog. How what would the first couple weeks of training me and Gus entail? So the way we start with all of our therapy dogs is just with basic obedience. So I want to make sure that anybody who is taking their dog out into any sort of public environment, 
um, first has control of them. So making sure that they're not pulling on the end of the leash, making sure that they can, you know, walk properly in the heel, all that sort of fun stuff. So it always starts with the simple basic obedience portion of things. Um, and then usually what we do is we spend some time with the dogs in our group classes. So that teaches the dogs to do all those same basic obedience commands just now with you know, a bunch of other dogs around and a bunch of other people around. So that really helps. It can't perfectly simulate like an environment, like a hospital or something like that. But what it does is teach the dog to work under high distraction. Um, and then after they spend some time in group class, then what we'll start to do is do like public outings or we'll teach specialized greetings. So with most of our therapy dogs, what we do is we always teach them go make a friend, which is basically their release. And I kind of like to put a point to it so that you know, if it was you that I'd like to provide therapy to, I'd say, Gus, go make a friend. And I'd point at you and then he'd kind of wander his way over there um, and he'd do his little task of some sort. So usually I'll teach like the paw command or I'll teach rest. So they come and they rest your, their head on your legs or something like that. So that the dog has an appropriate way to interact with whomever they're um, providing therapy for. And uh, can you give us some examples of some some humans and dogs that you've trained for therapy. Yeah, I mean, we have some pictures somewhere of some oh, of the yeah, dogs. There's the one of a, yeah. it looks like it's in a nursing home. That is um, Grace is that dog's name and her handler is oh. Becky. I don't know if you can find that. Let's I think see. it's we'll like, there we go. Yeah, so that's Grace at work. Oh, wow. So Grace is in nursing homes and she is a lovely little sweet um, pup and she's a great fit for a nursing home because she can get up there on their laps on their beds or whatever and she's just yeah she's been able to make a really big difference in the nursing homes that she's been and she you can tell she loves her work and her handler is an amazing mm -hmm. amazing person all of our teams are amazing so um how old would you say her owner is approximately and how old is grace grace just turned a year in january so she, oh, you can't be a therapy dog young. until you're a year so mm -hmm. we had you know we she um yeah she was just I think it was January. So yeah. anyway, so she's barely a year. And yeah, what her, did you say her breed was? She's, she's um, a, like a, a mix of uh, like a cockadoo, cockadoo or, or cockapoo, cockapoo or something maybe? like that. Yeah. Okay. Multi multi poo. Maybe. No, I don't know. It's something poo. Probably, yeah. <laughs> One of those. <laughs> and and her human partner is. Uh, her human partner is Becky. Becky, and uh, did you ask me her age? <laughs> I mean, she's like in her fifties or sixties. Yeah, I think she's so. retired. I mean, or she, she still she works. Is, but she she still does work. this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and she's actually. I think. I mean, Grace is such a great has been such a great therapy dog that I think she's going to probably expand past nursing homes and try to do some mm -hmm. other. Um, okay. Like some hospitals. And the reason I asked about school. age, I, I kind of envision that a lot of the people yeah. who get into it are retired. Fair. Right? Yes, I would yeah. say. Well, and Pretty with much most all of our, yeah, with most of our, actually, well, well, it's kind of split. I would say yeah. about a third of our therapy dog clients are somebody who has a, like a mother or a father that's in a nursing home right now. Mm -hmm. And then a third is someone who works within the school system. So we have mm -hmm. like superintendents, teachers, teachers yeah. um, counselors, stuff like that. So most of the people who we get as therapy are someone who works in an environment where they want to be able to take their dog to work and do something productive with right. them there. We also have a team, two dogs that are actually training for the homeless shelter right now. So mm -hmm. the, the handler works at the shelter. And then, so her and her husband are training and well, the kids actually are doing a lot of the training too. So those dogs will work full time at the shelter. She'll take them to oh, work with her every day. Yeah. And um, we've been working with them for about a year now, actually. Um, so pretty yeah. close to a year. And then um, we have also two other um, teams that work in residential treatment. And so their dogs will go to work with them, um, working with teenagers. So we have, yeah, so we have, it's split up. There are, there's a yeah. chunk of retired yeah. people, but there's also a lot of people who are, who are just planning on taking their dogs to work with them full time that, every day, I, which is know, amazing. And I mentioned the child service situation, but you've just described, you know, four other mm -hmm. situations where having a dog at work yep. uh, as a th trained yep. therapy dog, you know, yep. can be there and provide a great deal of joy and well-being and uh, to, to everyone. Well, we have a therapist also that is training mm -hmm. a dog to go. To, she does you know, private therapy and she'll take her dog to work with her because they, mm -hmm. that's just yeah been proven to be really helpful for people when they're telling their stories to have a dog there in the room. So let's open it up to the questions. We've got quite a few people here, live studio audience. We also have <laughs> people live streaming, streaming who can uh, uh, put their questions through our streaming yes. service. Yes. Questions for Kennedy and Jack or Gus? 
<laughs> yeah, Gus is ready to answer. What do you think, Gus? He's very quiet. He is a pretty quiet dog. He's not a barker or uh -huh. anything. No, or a growler. He just hangs. He just hangs out. So how many dogs uh, or pets do you have at home, Jack? I just have Gus, and then I have a Belgian Malinois as well, Freya. A Belgian Malinois. 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 <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's a, the French part of Belgium. They're the dogs yes. that you always see in the military. They're like jumping mm -hmm. out of planes and doing search and rescue. That's what kind of it. That probably helps. They look like a small bit, shepherds. Like a small yeah. German small shepherd. Small little yeah. petite yeah. shepherds. Yeah. She's okay. an amazing dog. And, and what about you, Kennedy? I have three. I have a corgi who's our, one of our work dogs, and then I have two pit bulls who were rescues who, yeah, have a lot of issues. <laughs> <laughs> yes. We have questions oh, back here. I, do, I, do I have the extra microphone here? Yeah, okay, oh, here we go. Hi, my question is, for owners who are working with you to train therapy dogs, what would you say is the one biggest piece of advice or maybe the biggest mistake or hurdle that you would just want people to be aware of to overcome when training a therapy dog? Probably early socialization. For most dogs, that can be the most the biggest hurdle to jump over because basically with, with younger dogs, if they don't get out and about and kind of learn that new experiences are fun when they're young, then a lot of times you'll see reactivity or you'll see anxiety come from that because they just have never learned how to take on new experiences, basically. So with a lot of stuff, it does start at an early age and you can do a bunch of different things to um, help them out with that, essentially. But uh, the biggest thing is just lots of, of new environments, new stuff um, there. Yeah, I have a quick question for you. You're talking about therapy dogs. Are dogs the, the best uh, candidate animal for therapy? And is there like therapy cats or birds and things like there's, that? Yep, there's therapy guinea pigs and therapy. I've heard of a therapy duck. Um, I've never seen the therapy duck, but ca cats, there's, yeah, cats, rabbits. Um, there's a lot of uh, horses for uh, are used for therapy, yep. Mm -hmm. Um, so there's, yeah, there's a lot of different animals that have had a lot of success with therapy. You know, we just love the, the whole dog thing. So, <laughs> of course. So my, and my, I, I would guess so. And the reason that I say that is because for most people you've interacted with a dog before. So on the therapy aspect of things, there's a good chance that when you were a kid, you had a dog that you liked or your neighbor had a dog that you liked or something like that. So my guess is it pulls from some of those memories when you were younger mm -hmm. and then the act that dogs, they've been evolving with us for a long time. So they do have intuition as far as like our emotions and what that means. Um, so my guess is as far as candidates go, they're just the most intuitive um, as far as therapy would go. Yeah, they know when to go in and when to step back. I've seen, I mean, I was a social worker for 25 years before I started this business. So I've done a lot of work with therapy dogs through the years and they just intuitively know when a kid is ready to, you know, to open up or when a kid needs a little bit of space. Um, and it's just amazing to watch. So I, I think that they are maybe the best candidate, but we could be a little biased too. I, I know there's great therapy animals out there besides dogs. I think horses have a lot of intuition also mm -hmm. from my yeah, experience with them. So. Yeah, Sorry. it's hard to get them in the elevator. I yeah. know, right? <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a question? Yes. Um, have you noticed with the therapy dog um, that they tend to lick people's fingers that have like neuropathy? Because mm. I have neuropathy and every time I meet a new dog, they come up lick my fingers huh. and if I don't have shoes on my toes also wow I, I have never noticed that but yeah. I will now pay attention just to yeah. see if gives I gives us something to look for yeah huh. you, you could have I'm <laughs> sure he would love to lick your fingers <laughs> Gus and do you want to lick Poon's toes <laughs> would you lick her toes yes he's ready Poon Yes. Yeah, here you go, Poon. Uh, 
Oh, he's really smelling them, isn't he? Yeah. Uh -huh. hmm. Well, there you go. Oh, cool. <laughs> I did not know that, but that is, I've never read anything that about that, but yeah. I'll have you to look that up. You guys have talked about um, glucose levels of the dogs noticing the difference mm -hmm. in change. Um, I had a dog, it was a lab spaniel mix that back in the day, it was my college dog, but he could tell when my mom's had a blood infection um, when she was septic mm -hmm. and before anyone else noticed right away. So there were a couple of times where it was his command, his, uh, just the way he reacted was just something so strange and we would call the doctor and get her in and it was and it one time it was almost a year in a different from we didn't realize her infection was back but it was a, the dog that actually mm -hmm. snipped it out as soon as he walked in and wow. was just it was like a crazy thing that he did i don't but and um, then, have you gotten any do any of your clients do like reading groups um i've had quite a few friends that they go into schools with their therapy dogs and children that are little dyslexic and don't like mm -hmm. to read out loud or stutter they work with a dog like one particular dog every week and then they they become reading and like to speak out loud so yeah i've, I've definitely um seen the studies and witnessed it too how yeah. dogs can make you know just kids more comfortable about communication and, and reading we have a couple like we said a couple of teachers, guidance counselors, administrative staff that are training their dogs. I don't know how those dogs are going to be used in the school, but I would imagine that they're going to get them in front of some kids like that because they said he wants to talk. So you mentioned, <laughs> um, you know, the service dog for the diabetic. And so if they recognize that there's hypoglycemia and the, the, the um, handler, the human is foggy and not, what does the dog do? Call 911. <laughs> uh, so usually what we do with stuff like that is we set an alert before they get to that stage. Um, so like with, with uh, people with uh, diabetes, usually it's at 91 where they set that, that alert so that we can stop that from happening before, um, before it gets to that point. To dangerous um, levels, yeah. With, uh, with most dogs, what we teach our diabetic alert dogs to do is be really, really persistent. So even if you're ignoring the signs, we teach yeah. them to get more and more persistent with it. So there's some dogs. So then that the handler will, recognizes the dog exactly. is telling yep. me so I need some sugar. Yeah, mm -hmm. we have some dogs who will gut punch or they'll like bite on the sides mm -hmm. or whatever. So we teach them that they need to go, 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 go. What other um, medical conditions like that where, where you're asking the dog or you're training the dog to look out for a particular condition? I mean, seizures is probably mm -hmm. too late or unless they can detect seizures is a really difficult one to train for most dogs like if i have a seizure alert dog they're already doing that um mm -hmm. before we start training because that's something where scent wise we don't necessarily know basically what we have to do is before if you can get it or after a seizure we take a uh, a scent sample which is basically just taking like a dental roll putting it in your mouth chewing it up and making it really gross like a spitball essentially and then using that to train for the scent but we don't we don't know what the dogs are smelling there so that mm. one's a little bit uh, mm. more challenging but we also have dogs that will smell blood oxygen levels mm -hmm. we have a client oh, who's okay. a little six-year-old boy um and his blood or his oxygen levels will drop and basically what the dog does right now is he Whenever he smells the oxygen levels going too low, he will go and stop the little boy from playing, make him sit on the ground until he's fine, and then he lets him back up. So there's a lot of really, really cool stuff they can do with scent. We have a question over here. <laughs> when you mentioned about diabetes. I'm a type 2 diabetic, and I go through, I have to wear a sensor mm -hmm. now and have to constantly check my myself and scared him a few times because I have a hypo pen because it can go as low as to 50. And so what qualifies a person to get a dog for for that? That, that? yeah. That's <laughs> <already qualified. laughs> okay, Dr. Demi. <laughs> Another good reason to get a dog. <laughs> is just proof of a diagnosis, whether that's a medical issue or a mental health issue or whatever, anxiety, whatever that is, and then a good candidate for a dog. And then that's, yeah. So, so you, you raise know, a good question, and, and maybe part of the underlying question is, okay, 
I, a person has a, a condition that is um, that justifies a service dog. I pull out my prescription and I write one service dog. Um, the, the question I'm getting at, does insurance provide any support for that? Because obviously you need to buy the dog, you need to train the dog, you need to take care of the dog. Uh, that's not an inexpensive undertaking. So have you ever been involved with trying to uh, uh, write letters of justification for insurance? We have tried. People have tried. There's currently people trying. Um, there's vets that are working you know, with the VA to try and get reimbursed for um, service dog training, too. But we have not had any luck. Probably more likely, and, and I'm just talking off the top of my head, I don't know, but um, organizations, not-for-profit organizations that provide mm -hmm. support yep. Mm -hmm. for uh, especially... Uh, service dogs. I don't know about the VA, whether the VA has any programs to provide some support or not that we haven't had any luck. Um, we do have a partner foundation that we work with, the Malinois Foundation, um, that pr will provide funding for people. And then we also have a couple other resources for diabetic alert um, funding for people that are um, who want a diabetic alert dog that they will pay for at least part of it. So there are some resources out there, but none of them are coming from like insurance companies or the VA. They're all coming from nonprofits. Okay. Yeah. Hey, Jack, I'm going to put you on the spot. Why don't you show us a little bit of training with Gus if, you, if he's up for it. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and uh, you know, I don't know, just whatever you want to walk him through some paces of things you've already trained him and maybe we can just see can you in action as how you train a dog. Sure, sure. Uh, so Gus really just has the basic obedience stuff. As you guys have seen right here, he's got <laughs> the place command down. Well. <laughs> so for him or for me, what the place command is, it means that he puts all four paws on something elevated. So for him, what we can do, Gus here. Play. Okay. Play. So it's very versatile. It can mean anything and everything that I point to that he can jump up on. Um, he can get up on here. My guess is he'll slide over the top and probably <laughs> fall off. So we won't do that. Um, the other commands we have are just like sit down, fun stuff like that. And then the heel command as well. Heel. So the heel command just means that it's his job to follow me around wherever I oh. go or offer up other <laughs> commands as well. Um, so this is one of the things that you see with training as well, where once you start to build a repertoire, the dogs will start to go ahead of you because he knows the game. When we do demos and stuff, he knows that there's going to be a place command. I just told him that that was play, so he's going ahead of me, which I personally don't enjoy. I'd like him to wait for me, but he is still in training. Hey, right, buddy. How old is Gus? Gus is a little over two years old. Yep, he is. He's still young, and most of my training, if I'm being honest, goes towards my Malamash. She needs about two hours of work every single day, so he has fallen a little bit to the wayside. <laughs> Was that right, buddy? But he gets to go to daycare at my mom's He hangs dad's. out. I'm in the <laughs> office all day, me and Gus, so he gets right, to hang with me all day while Jack's out training. That's it. Good boy. Down. And, and so he most does. of the commands are verbal, or are you doing Yeah, so the reason that I don't tend to use um, hand commands is because if the dog's not looking at you, especially in distracting environments, they probably won't see it. I teach a lot of my service dog clients to use both, um, but I always make sure that the, uh, the basic commands are just vocal because he's got pretty good hearing, right? Very good. <laughs> you don't use like a clicker. No, so we do a lot of different stuff. Like with service work, we use an e-collar for our training, for the basic obedience stuff, and then all the task work, same thing with therapy, is all treat training type of stuff. Um, so we use a variety of different methods. Each dog needs something different as far as training goes. So basically, I know how to teach or how to train with all the different tools, and I just kind of adapt to whatever the different dogs need. So um, like service dogs get a, quite the different training style than like a general basic obedience dog would get. Therapy dogs get a little bit different as well. So it just kind of depends on the dog, the handler, the scenario. There's a ton of different factors there. Anybody, Anybody in the room ever visited by a therapy dog when you were in the hospital? My mother was. It was interesting. And uh, I mean, we've been around dogs and mm -hmm. all kinds of animals. And the therapy dog came in 
And I go, look, mom. She goes, mm, yeah. And she was talking to the purple bear that I bought. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to put you in the room here. And, and it was like the dog was just so kind about it and just like, oh, came over to me so I could pet and then went off. I mean, I was glad that the dog didn't take offense, but I'm sure that's, <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's what's great about dogs. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm sure you come across it. Sometimes they're not, some people are not receptive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not everybody for whatever reason. You know, maybe they had an experience when they were younger or something that they're scared of dogs or whatever. So obviously they're not good candidates for, they won't enjoy yeah, it like the rest of just, us. You know, in, in pain. But sometimes even a patient who's not responsive for a dog to just mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. lay there, body contact, you know, yep. the, the, the having another um, warm blooded, mm -hmm. alive mm -hmm. entity with you even if you're not um, you know playfully interacting mm -hmm. can be therapeutic well and it's what you know well documented that do just petting the dog reduces blood pressure decreases your heart rate you know slows your breathing i mean just all of those mm -hmm. yeah things that are yeah, just do this which is just such a simple thing and the dogs love too i was a therapy um partnered with my great dane oh um, awesome so we did nursing homes and um, mentally challenged mm -hmm. uh, people. One thing that was really nice, everyone thinks the small dogs are great for older people, but a great Dane is amazing because they don't have to bend down to pet well, them. Their head, <laughs> their head the is right height. there. Anyone in a wheelchair <laughs> yep. that's like, they were always able to pet my yep. very first That's a good point. Dog. Mm -hmm. And she didn't jump and she wasn't a jumper ever. So it was a really, it was a good mix. For that's a really great, yeah. Really that's calm people so we have a day two danes in training for therapy right now or just one actually the other one hasn't started but we're really excited to get them out because yes. you don't see them out for you know they're just they're not very common dogs no. and so to no, have they're, they're, yeah they're, they're just great pretty very usually mm -hmm. very calm they are yep with. yep so we're really excited about that any other questions for jack or kennedy so we, before we bring it to a close, um, if individuals um, have a dog that they would like to train themselves and their dog to be a therapy dog, how would they get in touch with you? I actually have a slide with, our, I have some cards, but we, yeah, um, we'll so that up. we have a website, dogtrainingelite.com. Um, we also, um, you can email me, we have you can call. There's all of our contact information. I also have some cards up here if anybody's interested, and I can leave them too. So, um, and, and what's the average amount of time it would take? Let's say it's a, a dog that's fairly well behaved, and you know the dog and the and the the handler know each other quite well. Um, is there an average amount of time it would take to get certified? About a year, at, about at a least, year. probably. And that would be yeah. one day a week. It would be. I mean, with you, the, obviously yeah. they need to work yeah. every day. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So yeah, we do our training like with basic obedience stuff. It's just one appointment a week. I let you guys, you know, practice for seven days, come back, teach another command and kind of advance it that way. And then we hold two different group classes um, every week on Wednesday nights and Saturday mornings. Um, so basically with therapy, it's about a year of once a week, you're going okay. and getting some sort of face time with me or one of my other trainers. And if someone has a service need, would they, would they need to um, have that documented before beginning the process or, or you help them with that or yeah we, uh, yeah we can just talk through that when they come we always offer a free evaluation where we meet them meet their dog talk through the what the program is going to look like what we're, you know the expectations are of the dog and of the handler and then we kind of figure out you know what the next steps are for, as far as if we need to get that letter if we need to call you know write something down for the doctor or whatever it is so yeah okay yep it's, it's different for everybody any final words of wisdom? <laughs> Gus? Gus, what do you think? <laughs> Gus, can you... <laughs> <laughs> so Gus for another <laughs> there oh, we go. <laughs> Ended with a kiss. So.
again, thanks everyone for coming. Um, I'm Dick Deming, Medical Director of Mercy Cancer Center. Thanks for being here for the Cancer Education Series. If you know somebody who might uh, benefit by listening to this and couldn't uh, attend either live stream or in person, this will go on the Above and Beyond Cancer YouTube channel tomorrow, and it will also be housed at the Mercy Cancer Center website so that you can view this on demand. I hope you join us again next week. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.